Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. What does our very own Dutch East India Company have to do with the origins of the worldwide financial crisis? In his 2015 book, Der Souveräniteitseffekt, translated into Dutch by Huub Stegeman at The Financial Regime and just published by Boom Publishers in Amsterdam, cultural theorist Josef Vogel uncovers the roots of the financial crisis. How did this happen? And how is it possible that we apparently learned so little from it? Professor Vogel is professor of uh, modern Dutch literature at the Humboldt Universiteit in Berlin. And he argues in his book that the financial crisis is the effect of what he calls a financialization of the political agenda. And this financialization is made possible by the increasing interconnection between politics and economics. Today, Professor Vogel will present us his analysis of the financial crisis and its origins. After his lecture, he will discuss with Floris Heukelom, who is assistant professor of economics and business economics at our own Radboud University. And the discussion will be moderated by Arjen Klein-Herenbrink, who is a senior junior researcher at this uh, faculty and who holds an MBA and a master's degree in philosophy. My name is Paul Bakker. I am uh, academic advisor of Radboud Reflects. And on behalf of Radboud Lef Reflects, I wish you a very inspiring evening. And I would like to give the floor to Professor Vogel and welcome you to Nijmegen. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you so much for the invitation, for the kind invitation, for your hospitality and uh, the presentation. I would like to change my topic um, uh, a little bit. I would change my perspective. I uh, finally wouldn't talk about the origins of, uh, origins of um, financial crisis, but exactly about uh, the question, what is a financial regime? Uh, and uh, this will implicate also uh, an analy analysis of uh, uh, or the architecture of financial crisis. Um, but please uh, let, me, let me make one apology right uh, from the start. As you probably know and you mentioned it, um, I'm neither an economist nor a soci sociologist or political scientist, but I will speak nonetheless tonight about problems of economics, finance and political economy. I will have to claim the privilege of the layman to these disciplines, the private of the distanced few, and I ask you to grant me this privilege for the duration of this uh, ob observation or this, uh, this lecture. My reflections now um, are prompted by the most recent financial and economic crisis, including the Euro crisis. But in this case, I am less concerned with the collapse of the financial system, the perplexity of the experts and the unraveling of traditional economic doctrine. That was um, one of the topics of my last book, The Spect of uh, Capital. Instead, I'm now interested in something else, something that came into view with uh, the frantic secret negotiations that sealed the fate of Lehman Brothers 2008 and can still be observed in the politics of the ongoing euro crisis, something which is also the topic of this recent book, The Sovereign Effect or Financial Regime. What I'm interested in, uh, what I'm interested in is the following question. How is power organized and constituted in the financial system? What kind of power governs here? What is its mode or style of governance? And how compatible is it, um, is all this with democratic procedures or democratic systems? So, thinking back to the secret negotiations of 2008, negotiations between the federal government, the Fed, big banks and international investors, and more recently, to the politics of the euro crisis, you know the role of the ECB, the IMF, international creditors, the German government especially, what one notices is a style of governance, a power of making and implementing decisions that, I believe, stands out in four 
uh, significant respect. First, the entities making decisions are more or less informal committees, like the so-called European institutions, made up of state representatives, international organizations, private enterprises, big banks and rating agencies. In other words, this is a dispersed form of power which is informal in character and presents itself as a web of public and private agencies. These consortiums, secondly, are legitimated in every case as responses to emergencies and exceptional conditions. Since 2008, there has been repeated talk of an unwritten state of emergency. That is to say, the major exponents of this kind of politics are not sanctioned democratically, but at best procedurally on the basis of emergencies and exceptions. These things also apply thirdly to the measures taken. They are informal in character, operate in grey zones and keep crossing lines in the sand. Henry Paulson, US Treasury Secretary in 2008, said, I quote, the economic equivalent of war requires the deployment of martial instruments and powers, unquote. Fourth, implementing these exceptional measures from the bailouts of 2008 to the demands for reform imposed in Europe, uh, involves the assumption of quasi-sovereign competences, suspending budgetary laws, as in Greece, restricting fiscal uh, sovereignty, intervening in tax law and social policy, etc. What has taken shape here is a transnational executive power that governs across nation-states and assigns to itself the prerogatives of typical sovereignty. One can say, then, that finance power or the financial regimes with these four attributes has become an integral part of modern governance. I submit, however, that this condition is in no way new. It is actually coeval with modern states and economic systems. Throughout modern European or Western history, we find ourselves confronted with the formation of a type of power that is concentrated in the financial system but determines government policy and that despite its sway or its aggressiveness has received little attention in historical or theoretical respect. Do you understand my English? But I don't really understand what I'm saying here. But, um, <laughs> I hope uh, it will reach uh, your ears and even your brains. Um, allow me then um, to make a few uh, comments um, about uh, this kind of power. Allow me uh, to make a few comments on this beginning with three theses that frame my following reflections. First, uh, theoretical thesis. The traditional distinction between market and state, between politics and the economy, is a liberalistic myth that fails to capture essential aspects of modern governance. Such dichotomies uh, have rather limited extra, uh, explanatory value. A second historical thesis. The emergence of modern financial system is inseparable from the formation of strong state apparatuses. More precisely, modern finance issued from an intimate symbiosis of government entities and private enterprises or financiers. To this day, the financial system operates in a private public gray zone. A third, a political thesis this is precisely, it is precisely the 
democratization of Western societies, so um, the evolution of representative democracy, that has led to the immunization of certain sectors, particularly the financial sector, against democratic control. In the early 20th century, the Swedish economist Knut Wicksal had already put this in plain text. He said, the financial system has to be protected, I quote, against the tyranny of casual majorities of parliaments, unquote. The financial system, and this is the thesis, occupies something like a position of a fourth branch of government, of a fourth power in government. Allow me to highlight a few moments in the history of this financial regimes spanning from early modernity to the present. One can assert in good conscience that the primal, the primal scene of modern state building lies in sovereign debt. Even before states, modern states existed, in the modern states in the modern format of perpetual corporate personhood, perpetual public debts certainly did exist, typically accrued in the course of wars, campaigns and military spending. This began already in the Middle Ages in the city-states of northern Italy. In Genoa, for example, creditors were founding private companies for public finance as early as 1407, and to these companies were ceded a variety of sovereign rights the monopolies of taxation and jurisdiction, the right to declare war, contractual rights, etc. For one thing, we have here the direct integration of private creditors into government. For another, the emergence of the first financial markets, especially through the trade with government bonds and state securities. Then, no later than in the 16th century, we see the emergence of a coherent system in the form of modern finance state. The prototype was France under King Francis I, consisting of financial companies that acquired capital on financial markets or fairs, introduction of continuous taxation, consumption taxes and uh, indirect taxes, and the creation of a central financial administration, a unified, unified state treasury. Also here, we can see in the 16th century the integration of private credit, uh, creditors in governance. Here I'd like to point out three determining factors in these developments. First, a circuit of sovereign debt and taxation. This means that private financiers are the beneficiaries, uh, beneficiaries of tax revenue. Second, what were formerly responses to emergencies and exceptions like war bonds were made permanent and became administrative necessities. And finally, public debt Public finance is an essential motor behind the emergence of international finance, financial markets. In general, in general we, probably, we can probably say the emergence of territorial states of Europe um, in the emergence of the territorial states in, of, of Europe we have a two-fold problem. On the one hand, how can states be lastingly financed without relying the shifting favor of private financiers? On the other hand, how can private creditors, given legal guarantees, you know that state bankruptcies, confiscation of private property was the norm, the transfer of public debt in cases of dynastic successions was not guaranteed. To sum up, Public credit longed for a state debtor that would remain accountable for its debts and survive to repay them. Fiscal debt is a key motor behind the safeguarding of state sovereignty. Private financiers and banks 
pushed for the centralization and consolidation of the absolutist state apparatus. Then, in the 17th century, we see decisive steps toward a permanent solution of this problem. This means uh, the relationship between sovereign debt, credit, creditors, and state guarantees. We see key steps toward the political institutionalization, institutionalization of the financial system. And economic historians agree that one of the most important inventions, a wonderful invention, for the stabilization of the financial system, for the conjunction of public and private interests, was made in England. More precisely, in England in the year 1694. The situation was the usual one. The English king, William III of Orange, was bankrupt. He confiscated private estates. Um, this was followed by varied experimentation with projects to finance the states. For example, lotteries, multiplication of taxation. In England you had birth taxes and death taxes, bachelor taxes and marriage taxes, etc. And finally also alchemistical um, uh, experiments to make gold. Finally, the government accepted the proposal of a Scottish merchant named William Patterson, a kind of a financial egg of Columbus, a brilliantly simple solution to the financial troubles of the early modern era. 1,268 state creditors form a corporation. They give 1.2 million pounds to the government. They were guaranteed an interest rate of 8%. And for these interest rates, um, uh, duties and taxes were transferred to this private corporation. This was the founding of a new institute that still exists. This was the founding, probably you know it, of the Bank of England, an institution destined for greatness. I won't get you into the details or the disputes that surrounded the founding of the first central bank, but let me call attention to at least a few points. First, the special status of this institute, which is a model at which completely paradigmatic, a private enterprise with public mandate to finance the state. Second, the guarantee of legal certainty, the confirmation of legal privileges and of fixed interest payments to this private institution. Third, the special character of this government agency, a private enterprise turned into a government entity, but at the same time it was independent from the government. The King of England was spared from entering the Bank of England, could not participate in its deliberations. Even at the time, observers noticed this particularity. It was precisely the democratization of England, the glorious revolution, the King in Parliament, it was the democratization that made it possible for a private enterprise to assume a sovereign position in the government. Since the end of the 17th century then, central banks were serving to legally and institutionally secure sovereign debt and public credit, to integrate private financiers permanently into government business, to solidify private-public symbiosis in the form of the financial system, and above all, a private institute was given sovereign competences. This led to the rapid uh, expansion of financial markets and, in particular, established London as the financial centre of Europe, attracted international capital and thereby contributed significantly to the rise, the rise of the British Empire. 
I don't want to wade any deeper now into the complicated history of finance and central banks, a very interesting and, I think, important history, but it's worth keeping in mind at least the following point. The emergence of financial markets is essentially linked to the establishment of a fourth branch of government, of a fourth power in government in the form of central banks, in which the symbiosis of state apparatus and private financiers acquired an institutional format. Central banks, like the Bank of England, were at first privately run government banks to finance state debt, and only gradually did they receive other mandates, as we know them today. The monopoly of issuing money, for example, um, the protection of the banking system, the role of a lender of last resort, responsibility for the value of the currency, the regulation of money supply, the price stabilization and inflation control. Coming now to a second part of my reflection, I would like to remind you once more um, and one more time my original thesis which frame uh, my uh, talk here. Remember that the dichotomy between state and market does not capture significant elements of modern government power and particularly the operation of the financial system. Second, that modern finance emerged from a symbiosis of state apparatuses and private investors. And third, that precisely because of this, finance and financial system became a major player in the wielding of government power that for this very reason eludes democratic control through the executive or especially the legislative branches. Against this background, let me raise a final question. If it is true that the financial system decisively shapes the way we are governed, if it is true that financial markets, financial industries decisively frame and condition government actions, and if it is true uh, that no small amount of political decision-making power consolidates itself in finance, then what procedures, what institutions are responsible and ultimately accountable for all this? In other words, what are the components of the current, of our nowadays financial regimes, but also of our financial crisis? On this question, let me make a few final comments. A first condition of our current financial regime, probably you divine it, is or was the collapse of the Bretton Woods system in the early 1970s. And hence, the end of the post-war order, which was characterized by a currency system that locked the most important currencies into a stable exchange rate with the dollar and the dollar with gold. Whatever the reasons for the collapse of this system may be, among others it was um, uh, US foreign debt, since then drifting exchange rates have created the precondition of new financial instruments like currency derivatives and expanding capital markets. A second condition is or were the notorious neoliberal um, reforms prompted by the Thatcher and Reagan administration in the 1980s. You know, privatizations, deregulation of financial markets, tax break for interested bearing estates, privatization of social security and so on. This was the beginning of what has been called, and you mentioned it, financialization. The financial capital breaks out of its enclosure within the welfare state. Third, a third condition is a new and dominant part 
which is taken in finance by international organization and treaties. Most conspicuous um, in the role of the IMF. Since the 1940s, the IMF has served to coordinate international monetary policy, for example, by making adjustment payments in the system of fixed exchange rates. It lost that function with the demise of the Bretton Woods Agreement, and so, ever since the 1970s, the IMF has been taking on a new set of responsibilities. A new set of responsibilities as an institution that now controls adherence to certain stability criteria in the face of drifting exchange rates. That's the beginning of the great era of, you know this expression, structural adjustment programs, credit giving to developing nations and nations with emerging economies came with strict stipulations. Budgetary discipline, tax reform, privatization of state enterprises, protections for investors, liberalizations of the capital market, the labor market, easing for foreign investment. All these measures were summed up in the so-called Washington Consensus uh, at latest 1990. And fourth, and finally, we have here the reorientation or repurposing, repurposing uh, of central banks in the 20th century. This becomes apparent at the latest with the creation of the Federal Reserve System in the United States, which was founded in 1913, but also in the establishment, especially of the German Bundesbank or the ECB, the European Central Bank. And since then, I think at least three general tendencies in the operation of these institutions have to be acknowledged. That means, first, that these banks were not established as government banks to finance uh, the state, but as institutions which had the task to maintain the st stability of financial system. The background, for example, for the founding of the Federal Reserve was a financial crisis, bank um, uh, 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 bankruptcies, the need for being big banks uh, for a protection scheme. As government institutions, central banks are now and today, among other things, service providers for banks and financial markets, as bankers' banks, as lenders of last resort, as a capital reserve. Connected to this second, the special legal status of these banks. Um, they, um, uh, uh, they are characterized by a legal insulation from and immunization against other government agencies. In the case of the Fed in the USA, for example, government representatives are kept out of deliberations and decisions of the bank. Decisions of the Fed cannot be reversed by neither the President nor the Supreme Court. Um, and of course, in the 20th century, the dogma of the independence of central banks gradually took hold, certainly no later than in the 1990s, and most radically instituted in the case of the ECB. And probably in the, you know this famous article 107 of the European Maastricht Treaty, uh, which defined this independence. Um, let me cite, uh, cite uh, or quote uh, this article. Uh, quote, when exercising the powers and carrying out the tasks and duty conferred upon them, neither the ECB nor a national central bank nor any member of their decision-making bodies shall or must seek or take any instruction from European community, institutions or bodies, from any government of a member state or from any other body." Unquote. So, 
the establishment of a government enclave that is independent, immune and insulated with respect to all other government bodies, particularly with respect to control or oversight by the legislative branch. And finally, last characteristics, is the radical one-sidedness, the one-sided accountability of central banks. On the one hand, they are not accountable to or held responsible by elected governments. No accountability to the democratic electorate. On the other hand, they are accountable to the financial public. They are accountable to the public of financial markets, which is to say, to the investors and agents dictating the dynamics and trends of financial markets. As government institutions, central banks offer a kind of minority protections for members of the financial public against democratic majorities. Central banks are, in our days, today, a para-democratic uh, institution in nature. <clears throat> this uh, brings me to the end of my considerations. And let me finish now by formulating a few open questions, problems or observations concerning the present situation, perhaps also for, for our discussion afterwards. A first observation. If we are to speak today of a financial system, we are not referring to a purely economic matter, a spe special market system. The present financial system is rather a conglomerate of government bodies, central banks, international organizations like the IMF, and privileged private corporation uh, investment groups or rating agencies. It is a conglomerate of public, semi-private and private agents. One can speak here of a regulatory capitalism. One could speak also of a transnational executive branch, which is to say of a power that makes and implements political decisions that intervenes directly in national economies and in the politics of traditional national states. Second, this raises a connected problem um, that become already a major preoccupation for economists today, namely the devolution of the monopoly of regulating liquidity from states and central banks to financial markets themselves. We are witnessing a transition here from a financial system regulated by governments to a system of financial governance regulated by markets. This has two very important consequences. For one thing, central banks are increasing losing control of interest rates and the money supply in circulation. Money creation now happens in the markets itself. Even the vast quantities of cheap money injected uh, in the economy by the ECB, for example, have barely been able to counter deflation, uh, deflationary tendencies in recent years. For another thing, financial markets have become a prison for governments, a prison for states and societies. This has become particularly apparent in the politics of the ECB. The ECB is subject to a rule blocking it from purchasing bonds directly from European member states. Government bonds can only be purchased indirectly through markets. That's why states are now evaluated by these markets, setting up a kind of reputational or beauty contest among them. Finally, an automatic profit-generating mechanism has been set up. The ECB supplies 
private banks with cheap money, which they pass on to government as governments at higher interest rates. Financial markets have thus become the creditor of last resort. Third remark, all this gives rise to a financial policy dilemma. According to prevalent dogma, economic growth can be financed by low interest rates and cheap money. This has been the ECB's strategies for years, zero interest rate policy, quantitative easing, etc. But this very policy leads to the accumulation of future risk, risk uh, potentials. Cheap money is less likely to be invested in industry, infrastructure, and more likely to flow into capital and real estate markets due to higher returns of investment. The symptoms are already on the horizon. Stock market boom, explosive real estate prices. So, the very effort to generate economic growth summons the next financial crisis. Fourth and finally, and this would be my last remark here, it is a political dilemma. It's a dilemma concerning the scope available for political decision making. In Europe, this has become particularly acute or conspicuous in the Greek or Grexit crisis. Political decision makers now face contrary or incompatible interests. On the one hand, they are accountable to uh, the democratic voting public, subject to the sovereign of the people, if you will. On the other hand, they are accountable or constrained by a powerful minority, the financial public, uh, private creditors. This political and social cleavage will undoubtedly continue to occupy and afflict us. And I would say, in fact, that the financial public today is pitted in class struggle against the entire rest of the populations. Thank you for your superhuman patience, uh, and now we can start our discussion. Thank you. Okay. So, thank you very much for your lecture. But I would like to, I would like to start uh, by asking Flores to give your first response or your own take on these matters. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you very much for uh, allowing and assigning me the, um, the possibility to, uh, to respond to this, uh, this lecture. And um, I'd like um, to start with a compliment, not just because that is uh, what we usually do, but also uh, because I want to, um, first of all, recommend uh, both books that have been translated into Dutch, as they uh, really are a, uh, a great read and um, as opposed to many economic texts. Um, so I think there your background has, uh, is, 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 of, is of a great help because it takes the reader in a quick but very enlightening way through a lot of history and, and arguments. Um, but I also think that this is, uh, these are important books because the economy our, and our society at large of course are subjects that are uh, much too important to be uh, left only to bureaucrats and governments, uh, economists, um, and whoever else professionally um, occupies him or herself with these matters uh, throughout the day. So also in that regard, I think it's very important to have people from all uh, kinds of sites uh, working on this uh, uh, topic. Um, so I just wanted to start saying by, uh, start saying, um, T uh, taking this uh, perspective. Now coming to the first um, maybe question, you ended with uh, say a dilemma, political dilemma as you called it, where um, say the ideal of, of democracy clashes with the, the, the power of uh, financial institutions. 
Um, and that is true, I think. Um, but then my immediate follow-up question is, okay, if that is true, then so what? what? What do we do about this? Do we need to do something about this? Or is this simply, say, the least worst state of the world that we know and that we simply have to accept? Normally, uh, this would be in the last question. Now it's uh, the first question. Yes. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, shall we end after my, <laughs> after my answer? Um, um, uh, so I think this, uh, 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 this story is much more complicated. Uh, it's not only a question uh, uh, what to do or how to resolve problems. Mm -hmm. I think um, first is, uh, the first um, step would be to uh, describe in a realistic manner uh, what happens there? Mm -hmm. And uh, you have it. I think you have. You had a very clear image um, in, um, yeah, if you want, the Greek clash, yeah? mm -hmm. or the clash between uh, the Greek uh, population or mm -hmm. the Greek electorate and European um, institutions. Mm -hmm. What was interesting in this case? Not only that uh, Syriza said we do not want to make these reforms, mm -hmm. but and this was much more provocating, the thesis that the decisions of European institutions, uh, the ECB, mm -hmm. European Commission, and even the IMF, these decisions were not technological decisions, uh, these decisions were not technocratical decisions, but decisions with a very strong political impact. Mm -hmm. uh, the thesis was these decisions are directed against uh, the poorest in Greece mm -hmm. and in favor for the richest in the world, this means the, the creditors. Mm -hmm. And as you know, uh, 80, 70 to 80 percent of all the money which was pumped to Greek mm -hmm. s uh, immediately went back to the so-called Nord banks in Germany and in, 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 in France. Mm -hmm. um, so this was um, um, the repolitization uh, re mm -hmm. uh, of a technocratic solution first, yeah. uh, and second, it showed uh, that uh, the politics of the European institutions was uh, uh, led by a certain uh, minority um, minor mi minority uh, securization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But why? What makes you suggest it was a minority? Wasn't it simply the the ma majority of Dutch <laughs> and German? voters who simply said, um, sure, let's give some money to the uh, Greek, yeah, but only... But, but this uh, was, a, 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 and this is important, it was dramatic, this was simply a lie. So the German voter was told, uh, they in Greece, mm -hmm. in Spain, in Portugal, they are spending your taxpayer money. Mm -hmm. This was not true. It was the bank of international lenders. Mm -hmm. It was the Deutsche Bank, uh, it was, it was uh, uh, um, uh, Societe Generale, etc. Mm -hmm. Big banks who lended uh, money to, uh, uh, to Greek because they could make a lot of money. Uh. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the rating agencies uh, raised the interest, uh, interest rates uh, of Greek. So yeah. if you invested in Greek, you could really earn a lot of money. Mm -hmm. uh. And these institutions earned a lot of money. And when Greek was nearly bankrupt, um, European states pumped money in them, which went back to uh, uh, the international companies, which already earned a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And it, no German taxpayer uh, paid for uh, one penny for, for, for Greek. Mm -hmm. and, but then didn't have uh, the Greek government uh, have the option to simply say, let's not go with this, we'll go bankrupt. Mm. Uh, will not pay back all those uh, all these debts. Yeah. Uh, we'll uh, go I it on our own. Yeah. So yeah, you, you, in you're that right. sense, it's yeah. a dilemma. Uh, this, I think, this was a, a, a very complicated uh, complicated situation. But I don't want to speak as an economist. You are the economist here, yeah. and um, uh, um, it was a complicated situation, uh, uh, which became dramatically for one reason, which is the drama of each nation state in the world mm -hmm. and this drama is capital flight. Mm -hmm. You have had this 
capital flight in Argentine, you have it in Brazil now. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Brazil is unable to refinance itself in the market. Um, and this is one of the results of the financialization. Uh, so uh, you have, can have a lot of crisis, but the biggest crisis and the biggest drama for a state is capital flight if no investor is going back in the country. And this was the situation in, uh, in, in, in Greece. Mm -hmm. and, and what would your solution be ah. to this? Financialization, because I think I and, and many of the people here could agree. I think uh, that this, this uh, let, me, uh, uh, let me uh, let me cite economists. Uh, probably you realize that in the last weeks, the IMF made a change in its politics, nearly 180 degrees. Mm -hmm. So uh, the IMF said our politics in the last 30 years was false, and it was false in one important respect. Uh, to force countries to open them for international investors and to bind them to international investors. Mm -hmm. So probably it would be, and this is a suggestion of the International Monetary Fund, mm -hmm. uh, probably it would be more interesting to restrict capital flows, uh, to restrict foreign capital investments in um, weak uh, countries, mm -hmm. um, uh, simply uh, to minimize um, the danger of capital flight. This was one of the recent propositions of, uh, of the International um, Monetary Fund. Now, I think last week. Mm -hmm. So this would be uh, one. Uh, so res re restricting international investors, uh, uh, restricting national economies uh, against um, uh, international investors would be one of the solutions, or one yeah. step. Yeah. So that would mean more control of the government exactly. by of, of, by governments of yeah. of markets. Yeah. So yeah. It's, uh, you see, in, uh, 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 Greece is uh, uh, a completely insane example. Uh, the first thing what happens in in Greece mm -hmm. was the opening to international investors, and this means the n uh, uh, the national lottery company. Mm -hmm. uh, which uh, earned a lot of money for Greek government, yeah. was sold to Chinese investors. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, second, the airports, which earned a lot of money for uh, Greece government, was sold at the half of the value um, to international investors. Uh. Mm -hmm. So this was completely insane. This is the opening uh, of uh, uh, the market for, for, for privatization and for international in investors. And this could have been, uh, um, uh, how to say, in German, Vermieden. Man hätte das vermeiden können. Yeah. Could, could have been could avoided. Could have been avoided. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, another question that yeah. I... Uh, that, that, uh, Be before that, oh, can sorry. I answer a follow-up question? If you, if you will allow me. Go ahead. Go okay, ahead. thank you. Because you said that the IMF is now admitting uh, our policy from the past 30 years. Yeah. Um, which was too extreme, we need to adapt and so on, which yeah. made me think of... And, and which was not successful. No, yes, this is it failed, it failed yeah. flat it, out. It failed even economically, not only politically, it failed economically. So, so one of the things that struck me in, in reading yeah. uh, your, your books is the question that, the question of why this rhetoric of a constant state of ex exception mm. and this language of complexity is so successful. So this idea that there's a crisis in Greece and what we, the people here, is it's too difficult, there's too much of a hurry, we need to act now, our normal oversight bodies don't work, we need informal groups of experts who can make quick decisions because uh, our world just happens to be one mm. in which these crises, crises yeah. pop up. Now, I I'm, I'm not that old, but I'm old enough to mm. know something about welfare states in the 20th century where the idea was the precise opposite, where the idea would be that, mm. you know, um, 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 enlightened players in the market, mm. plus governments, plus the people would tame our economies and make them predictable yeah. so that all would benefit. Mm. And there, is, there seems to have been this shift that has taken place behind our backs in, well, I'm 30 years old, so it's not that, it's, it's really quickly, it's yeah. in 10 or 20 years. And the question basically, how, how does that yeah. 
come to pass? How did that yeah. happen? Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting question. Uh, probably one cannot answer it completely, but we can give uh, it at least some hints. So it's completely correct that um, after the Second World War, um, uh, the international economic order was dictated by the fear that uh, capitalism could um, be endangered by tensions, by polarity, uh, etc. And so the welfare state was one of, uh, if you want, a uh, survival kit of capitalism. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a survival kit of, of capitalism, minimize uh, social tensions, especially in Germany, uh, uh, um, uh, led by the so-called ordo liberalism uh, after the Second World War, minimize capitalist uh, tensions, uh, dramas, etc. Mm -hmm. um, a first step against this world order of the world welfare state was uh, the wonderful and uh, prominent and important uh, the other 9-11, 9-11, uh, 1973. Uh, it was uh, Chile. The, uh, Chile, uh, Chile and uh, the military putsch and what Melanie Klein called shock therapy. This was the first time uh, when uh, the idea and the reality of a welfare state was consequently destroyed. Mm. Uh, and uh, in the eyes of the liberalists, Milton Friedman in Chicago, this was a success. This was a political success, stable government, and this was an economical success because international investors now were present up to now in, in Chile. Um, and linked to the new situation after the end of the Bretton Woods Agreement, um, suddenly people realized and these were especially the governments of Reagan and Thatcher, that our capitalism can support much more poverty, much more tensions than we thought. So we can, and this was the expression of the advisors of Thatcher, we can have in Great Britain a managed decline. Managed decline means stabilize financial economy and de-industrialize Great Britain. This means uh, uh, um, Liverpool, Manchester, Leeds, etc. Now these are third world uh, zones uh, in the midst of Great Britain. And uh, the capitalism now uh, can survive with much more poverty, with much more social tension, and it works very well. And I think uh, the shock therapy in Chile was a first experiment and they saw that it functioned. And step by step uh, this a uh, worldwide experiment was introduced in, I think, my, most of uh, Western countries. Does that mean that yep. you also think that we should go back to this order liberal approach of, of Erhard and all the others in the um, um, post era? Yeah, uh, it's, it's interesting. Um, so we have, for example, uh, uh, our leftist party in, in Germany, mm -hmm. Die Linke, probably, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, is the only party who refer to the old order liberalism, mm -hmm. not the socio-democrats, not the conservatives. So they are reading now Rusto, they are reading mm -hmm. uh, Müller Armack, etc. And why? Because these order liberalists, or at least a part of them, uh, dreamed a third way between um, planning economy or planified economy mm -hmm. and liberal market economy. Uh, this was uh, the invention of the uh, Sozialstaat, invention of uh, soziale Marktwirtschaft etc. So yeah. a third way. But uh, in Germany it's really uh, uh, only the uh, Linkspartei um, who uh, is dreaming uh, back to this order liberalism. Mm -hmm. and, and not to Marx by the way. Mm? No. <laughs> <laughs> and how, how feasible is it to, to implement this, this order liberal uh, We will see. Also. Uh, I think, uh, I, I'm not a prophet, but um, uh, uh, I think one topic will become more and more important in future elections. And we can see it in Germany, we have elections in autumn. Uh, um, uh, I think, and this sounds very uh, dry, but I think it's important. Uh, the most prominent uh, asset of political conflict would be taxation politics. Mm -hmm. uh, taxation r reform. And uh, in Germany this starts al already. Uh, so uh, uh, how to tax 
um, uh, capital incomes, for example, how to tax international capital flows, etc. These would be, I think, very important uh, uh, political assets for the future, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. It, sounds, it sounds completely, uh, it's, it's, uh, it sounds like a, a minimal problem, uh, but I think it's uh, uh, one of the most um, important social decisions are made by taxation, because taxation uh, decides about political participation, but also of, about economic participation. Mm -hmm. But there aren't strong and independent central banks that control the financial sector also, yep. not also part of this yeah. approach? Uh, yes, uh, yes, um, uh, I, I think so. Uh, um, um, but I think now uh, the problem is much more complicated. You have, even in central banks, mm -hmm. you have uh, uh, completely different politics. Uh, so take the old German Bundesbank, which was mm -hmm. the model for the ECB. Mm -hmm. uh, um, a very restrictive monetary policy Mm -hmm. And suddenly there is someone like Draghi coming from Goldman Sachs yeah. and importing American politics. Now the ECB is acting like an uh, American Federal Reserve Bank. You know? mm -hmm. uh, and it's uh, a big conflict, for example, with Germany and the Bundesbank. You know? So even in these politics, I think there is no common uh, opinion. There is no common sense. Mm -hmm. About these uh, banks. Yeah. Because there, there seems to be something desirable about things as they stand, namely the fact that there's something more powerful than government. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people after reading your book, well one of the, the returning themes is that you could say that in some situations, as you also said in the lecture, uh, financial markets c come to serve as a prison for governments. Mm -hmm. um, but if I look at the Dutch yeah. politicians, for example, there is a certain relief in thinking, well, <coughs> there is an actor, yeah. in, there are actors in this world yeah. who have them uh, by the balls, so to say, who are more powerful than them. Yeah. Thank God these idiots yeah. cannot do just what they want. I mean, there is, mm. I can see the logic behind yeah. this whole creation of central banks that you describe very yeah. precisely, and you also seem to suggest, you, from what I mm. think you would like to see in the world, is certainly not a reintegration of everything that has to do with finance under a political sovereign. Yeah. You're completely right. So I think one of the ratios of this central bank independence was exactly to delegate political decision-making to so-called neutral bodies. Mm -hmm. And this means especially uh, that uh, in cases of crisis, for example, uh, when you want uh, to uh, fight uh, unemployment, mm -hmm. uh, when you want to um, uh, uh, reinforce social politics, etc., uh, you should invest and probably you create inflation. Mm? Um, and with reference to central banks, politicians can say, it's, we are not able to do this. It's not possible. We cannot change our uh, unemployment politics. We cannot change social politics because there is a sort of Sachzwang. This means uh, a force, a neutral force like mm -hmm. central bank and monetary uh, policy. I think this was explicitly made to have, if you want, um, um, uh, was heißt sauber? Um, Pure. Pure, clean, clean hands. Politicians can have clean hands. Um, uh, and this was Im very important, uh, especially for social democrats. Mm -hmm. We cannot invest in uh, labor markets because we are framed or uh, restricted by financial markets and by the conditions of the central banks. And then to follow up, if I can, if I can quickly follow up on that yeah. question. Um, one could also conclude and see that there is a certain democratic deficit here. The fourth mm -hmm. power that you, that you speak about, all these informal committees and the banks that can take very important decisions, there is no democratic mm -hmm. uh, accountability. But you also say uh, in, the, in the fourth chapter of your book that the more uh, the world of finance and stocks and capitalization becomes subject to public opinion, the more vulnerable it becomes to hysteria, mm -hmm. prone to hysteria. So would not an increase in democratic control, in the voice of the people, in whatever financial decisions are taken, also increase the vulnerability of that very system to our emotions? Yep. 
Um, yeah, I think the most uh, emotional uh, uh, scene in our societies are financial markets. Uh, they are completely emotional. There you have hysteria, there you have positive feedback, there you have you all kind of mania, if you want. Uh, uh, so democracies uh, are a very calm, uh, yeah, I, I would uh, say even phlegmatic organisms. Uh, uh, but um, financial markets, uh, these are um, hysterical persons uh, first. But um, I, I think um, uh, uh, we should define what is democracy. I wouldn't say democracy is identical to plebiscite or something like that, but um, democracy uh, is a kind of organization of political power uh, which gives uh, the electorate uh, the possibility of a veto. It's a veto power. Mm. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's important from time to time to refer to a veto power uh, in some respect. And it's interesting that uh, especially central banks uh, cannot be vetoed by any electoral executive legislative branch of government. Uh, only this, not control and not plebiscite and not uh, majorities who now determine our monetary policy, but the question how we to power could be organized. First point. And second point, uh, I think which very is, it's, it's very important for Europe. I think uh, that monetary policy, which is now delegated to central banks, and fiscal policy, which is uh, uh, the task of national states, cannot be separated this way. We see that fiscal policy is dependent from monetary policy, and now uh, it should be possible to coordinate monetary policy and fiscal policy. Sometimes it could be important, even necessary, that state engage in an investment, even make debts, for example, to uh, uh, strengthen infrastructure, to, uh, uh, to rebuild uh, the ruined uh, uh, cities in Germany, uh, even, in, uh, even in, in, in the Netherlands, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think there is a close relationship between fiscal and monetary policy, and now they are, in the moment, they are completely separated in different organisms. States, nation states on the one hand, and the central bank on the other hand. Can, can I take for, for a second the um, say position of the devil's advocate yeah, and um, um, uh, take the Milton Friedman and, and Buchanan and all the mm. other neoliberal liberals' position um, just uh, for, for fun of the argument? Um, because in your whole story, you seem to impl implicitly assume that the democratic institutions are neutral, uh, mm. will enact whatever the public wants mm. and also that the public rationally can decide on what mm. they want um, and then uh, that once elected all these politicians and uh, bureaucracies yeah. just um, do what is asked of them. And that is of course not true mm. because politicians as soon as they are in yeah. place they will just use their discretionary power to build the bridges in their own city, to enrich yep. themselves, and also the bureaucrats will try to get um, big salaries, as many people in their department mm. to feel important, and so on. So, isn't um, isn't this what isn't this a big blind spot in your uh, approach? The, this this assumed neutrality of government of democracy? No, no. Uh, uh, I think uh, it's uh, especially contrary. I do not say that it's, it's not neutral. Mm -hmm. uh, I only say that their uh, declarations mm -hmm. are political ones and this means um, they are partisans. This is very clear. Political mm -hmm. decisions are no neutral decisions. They are defined by interests. Mm -hmm. uh, and my uh, intervention only uh, wants to clarify that the so-called technocratic, neutral uh, operations of central banks, for example, mm -hmm. are uh, in the deepest uh, political decisions with certain interests. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is the, so let's simply talk of political interests and uh, who is uh, um, the profiteur 
of these uh, interests. Uh, this is uh, 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 the only question. Uh, mm -hmm. We have to talk about, if we talk about economics, we have to talk about economic aims. And we have to about, uh, talk about economic interests. And mm -hmm. these interests can be defined. Uh, this is very clear. Uh, uh, when, when you have a, a, a huge fortune, you have a huge capital, you have interests. Mm -hmm. If you don't have any fortune and don't have any capital, if you only have your working power, you have an interest. Uh, so let's talk about these interests and not about technocratic rules uh, which are necessary because etc. Mm -hmm. So repolitization, uh, finally. But so, so you do think that what Draghi now does with all the quantitative easing yeah. um, is a result of political interests and not yeah. of, say, theoretical ideas yeah. of how best to yeah. organize yeah. Uh, exactly. the system. Draghi does something which no national state would have been able to do, printing money, mm -hmm. printing a lot of money, printing so much money that the next crisis is already uh, seen on horizon. No? Mm -hmm. This is, uh, uh, this is uh, a, a, a fairy tale, an uh, economic fairy tale. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. There, I, there I would disagree. I think yeah. it is a, okay. I, I mean it's a it's an economic theory that I would also not entirely agree with, but I do think mm. that it's a, um, for Draghi at least, um, having had his PhD at MIT with all the Keynesians, where, where Samuelson and Krugman all came from, yeah. this is a very clear economic idea. I don't think Draghi um, uh, starts all this quantitative easing to, uh, I don't know, serve political interests maybe of his home country or no, no. of the... No, 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 can I just, not just, just really quickly because, I, and I hope yeah. I'm not the only one, but can either yeah. of you do the one minute explanation of quantitative easing? Yes. <laughs> okay, <laughs> please. <laughs> it's, uh, um, uh, in the old days, not, not anymore today, but in the old days it was banks who printed money. Um, and they can print as much money as is needed by the public, but they can also print additional money and then start spending it. And that's essentially a free consumption because you print the money, you have a stack of 100 euro bills and you just buy whatever you want to buy um, and it only costs this, uh, the, the amount of paper and ink that you had to pay for it. And if you do this, and th that's the idea behind this, and by the way, I do think this goes back to Babylonian uh, times, um, if you print more money than is needed in the economy, you create inflation, um, and, and which is sometimes called, and then which is sometimes called then the effect of seniorage. So you deflate, you inflate the uh, the amount of money, the value of money in the economy, um, and therefore you can yeah, have a free consumption every time you do this. And, and the and the idea is, and in this case, this is on purpose because. Inflation is considered too low, and that they, they hope that with this creation of, uh, of, of free money, that the government is, is and, and s banks are free to spend, uh, inflation will be raised. Uh, inflation will be uh, uh, raised uh, and, yeah. uh, and investment uh, facilitated. Uh, this means yeah. uh, cheap credits, uh, simply cheap credits or even zero uh, credits uh, yeah. to invest in economy. So this is the idea behind. Yeah. I would like to thank <laughs> Professor Vogel and Dr. Herkelum and of course all of you for tonight. And thank you, thank no. you for the questions and uh, thank you once more for the invitation. And thanks to Bohm, this is the reason why I'm here. Um. So, that leaves me with one more task to fulfill and that is to announce the next lecture which will be called um, Van God Los door Hans Boutelier op 14 juni om half zeven. En u kunt zich daar allen via de website van Radboud Reflects wederom uh, voor inschrijven. Dank u wel.